So I'd like to welcome everyone that's in, in at the moment. We're just uh, gonna wait for a few more people to, to join the, the webinar and then we'll, we'll get going. Um, nice to have you here and I hope you're, you're doing well. Okay, so there's about 200 of you in at the moment. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and start with the, the introduction to the webinar. Um, first and foremost, hello everyone and, and welcome to today's webinar, um, the customer service leader of the future. Identify the strategies you need to stay ahead of the game. I'd like to first say that I hope everyone's in good health um, and to extend a thank you to everyone of the over 1,300 of you joining us today, be that live or on demand later. We're really excited to have you all join our discussion today. While we wait for those of you who are still joining, I'll run through a brief introduction of, to our fantastic panelists and go over a few bits of housekeeping so that we can keep things run, running smoothly. Myself, I'm Scott Cormack, Global Event Director at Reuters Events. Some of you will have probably already had contact with me when troubleshooting in the run-up to today. Um, we've got a great panel on our hands today with some superb customer experience leaders who are eager to dive into our discussion. So I'll waste no time in introducing. First up on the panel today, we have Nigel Henry, Director of Customer Experience at Pizza Hut. Nigel is a close friend of us here at Reuters Events, having featured as a speaker at our in-person events back when those were a thing. Um, Nigel has some really interesting insights to share regarding the way that Pizza Hut have updated and adapted to this new world that we find ourselves in. Next up is Mike Keeney, Chief Customer Experience Officer at Extended Stay America. We're really excited to introduce Mike to our community in his first collaboration with us here at Reuters Events. Mike is bringing to the table some truly fascinating insights about how he has had to navigate the period of great upheaval the travel industry is going through at the moment and how Extended Stay America are empowering their agents to provide top class customer experience. Rounding out today's panel, we have Mike McCarran, VP of Customers at today's sponsors, Gladly. Gladly's mission is to provide radically personal customer service at scale. They offer a fantastic platform that boasts the ability to increase contact center generated value by an average of 10% increase service member efficiency by 20% and save you an annual average of 40% on consolidating your tech. Finally, I'd like to welcome back someone who many of you will know by now. Recently home from a stint in the Air Force, we're grateful to have our ever-present moderator back, Nicholas Zeisler. Nicholas is the principal of Zeisler Consulting and a former director of CX at HP, and we're excited to have him back steering the direction of today's webinar. Before I kick things off, I'd just like to highlight some quick pieces of housekeeping. Um, as some of you who have attended our previous webinars may have noticed, we've now switched over to the Zoom platform. I know everyone's had Zoom and turned into a Zoom expert over the last four months of team meetings and, and virtual work drinks, so I will keep this brief. Um, like I say, there are over 1,300 of you joining us today from a host of different countries and exciting brands such as Hilton, Foot Locker, Verizon, Ford, IHG, Microsoft, Ubisoft, Samsung, the list really does go on and on. It's really exciting to have all of your expertise joining us today. As such, please do let us know in the chat function that you should see on your hotbars if you have any questions that you would like to propose to the panel, or even any feedback and opinions you have on what's being discussed. We welcome all of your interaction and we'll be sure to incorporate this throughout the webinar. Finally, today's webinar will be recorded. So if you would like to watch me give this intro speech again, or if you'd like to revisit some of the discussion from today, please do keep an eye out for that in your inboxes over the next couple of days. But that's enough from me. Handing over to you, Nicholas, why don't you dive into this exciting discussion we have today? Thanks, Scott. It's uh, great to see what you look like finally. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's, now it finally is the new world. Yeah, we're, face we're to all, face. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, so to speak. Great. Thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, let's just dive right in. And uh, as was alluded to in, in Scott's introduction, Nigel, I, I want to jump in and, and start with you, actually. Uh, we're in a new world, COVID-19. Everything is different. Everything is changing. Would you share with us a little bit about what's new for your industry, which is to say restaurants and, uh, and, and the food industry? Yeah, certainly, Nicholas. Uh, I mean, as you quite rightly said, we're certainly in a new world. And, you know, uh, before I dive into the question, just kind of thanking the Insight Group for having me on today and certainly joining um, uh, with Scott and welcoming the, uh, the viewers today. Uh, we're certainly in a new world and, um, you know, for us at, at Pizza Hut, 
we have made, I would say, more changes uh, in the last three months than we've probably made in five to 10 years. So the, the rate of change in our business has been uh, phenomenal. Um, it's, it's been unlike any other. It's, it's been unlike anything I have certainly seen before. Um, and with that rate of change, uh, it has it is, you know, disrupted our business significantly, but done it for the better. Um, so when we think about customer experience and customer service, um, you know, we've had to really lean into some of the tried and tested methods from a customer experience standpoint, kind of go back to our DNA of thinking about the customer and serving the customer in order to succeed in this new world, but do it with speed, do it with expediency, do it with agility. And, and for us, uh, probably, uh, we, you know, there are two prevailing themes of what we've done in this new world. So really the rise of all of our contactless uh, offerings. So if we think about contactless delivery, if we think about uh, contactless carryout, uh, if we think about curbside carryout, uh, those are elements of our operations that we've really had to uh, lean in on, accelerate and uh, get really quickly into uh, delivering uh, for our customers. And um, co uh, in parallel with some of these contactless services uh, and, and interwoven, quite frankly, within these contactless services has been really the element of safety, which I know it's not uh, unique to us as a brand. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we are all facing it, you know, regardless of what industry you're, you're playing in right now. So really the element of safety um, and uh, team member safety as well as our guest safety. So, you know, bringing those together has been critical for us, kind of thinking about what we do for team members to ensure that they're safe. Um, not only are they safe in terms of the uh, personal protective equipment we give to them, not only are they safe in terms of the operational procedures that we roll out and the training that we provide them, but also that they feel safe. Right. So when we think about uh, experiences, you know, providing the tools, but also connecting with them emotionally so that they feel safe coming to um, work every single day. And once we do that, that then enables our team members to provide our customers with a safe experience so that our customers also feel safe. So in terms of the, the, the plethora of um, kind of new new uh, procedures and tools and equipment we've put out into the restaurant. It's been about ensuring our team members feel safe and ensuring that our customers feel safe. So as they both um, you know, engage with the brand, engage with the product, then we're delivering an amazing experience. We've seen a lot of data, uh, Nicholas, as it pertains to customers are choosing brands and they're choosing experiences today where they feel safe, right? Uh, and it's not only just a demonstration of uh, tools and processes, but it's when they enter your establishment, when they engage with your products, uh, are, you, are you providing that perception, that sentiment of safety to customers? That's really critical in terms of what we're seeing. So, you know, contactless experiences and ensuring that safety is interwoven between, uh, uh, within that is, has been pretty important for us over the last few months. Yeah, Nigel, I hear a, a theme kind of coming through with what you're saying here. A lot of it has having to do with perception and communication and emotions. You know, in the food industry, there's always the, you know, the safety and health checks and you see the certificate on the wall and so forth, right, that people don't really think about. And now that it's in the forefront of everybody's mind, I hear what you're saying and, and perhaps you'll go a little further on this, but, but correct me if I'm wrong, what you're saying is that it's not just about doing those things, it's about sharing with your customers the experience and, and letting them know, yeah, this is what we're doing and this is why and it's important to us and having folks buy in and recognize that. Absolutely, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, you know, in, in the industry, and it still remains the same uh, right now where doing those things have, you know, a, a tip, what we call tip of right? So entry point, you, you kind of have to do them. Uh, you're going to serve safe food. You're going to ensure the health and safety of your organization is, is uh, on point. Uh, yes. So that, that was the world we were in right now. But the world we're in right, uh, we were in before, but the world we're in right now is customers are actually using that as an active decision-making point, right? Whereas historically, that, that was sort of expected. Now they're 
actively using that as a, as a decision making point. As a matter of fact, when we look at some of the key customer experience metrics within our business and we get into the deep insights and analysis and say, okay, what, what, what factors are driving a customer to rate us utilizing our key customer experience and metric, uh, either as highly satisfied or highly dissatisfied, we have seen a uh, safety and hygiene elevate in terms of its importance. So for us, traditionally, you know, things like taste of food, uh, things like speed of service, things like uh, the, the, the hospitality and the experience our, our, our employees give to customers have always been prominent uh, in our industry. And, but what we've seen is that safety and hygiene in the metrics we're looking at today has actually elevated in prominence. So, uh, and, and that, that is, you know, certainly reflective of the times that we live in. Yeah, absolutely understandable. Let's bring the other guys in here. Uh, Mike McCarron, um, you're not, you're not B2C, but uh, share, share with us sure. the impression that you're seeing uh, with Gladly from your customers, uh, your clients, how are they seeing things having changed? And, and are yeah. they reflecting what Nigel was sharing as well? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that what, um, you know, what Nigel's hitting on in terms of the, the way in which people are approaching how they engage customers, the way in which they're providing confidence and a sense of trust around the brands that they do business with. I think it's a big part of, of how a lot of companies are now thinking about, okay, before COVID, now sort of post COVID or sort of in the middle of it all, what are they going to do to help those customers have great experiences with their brands? And I, I just kind of maybe comment on a couple of things. Obviously, um, Gladly as a technology provider has, has a different view or a different lens within which we look at the impact of COVID. But some of the things that I think are really important, and this is, my guess is, is going to be consistent and a, um, a theme that many who are on this attending webinar are going to experience is that many folks who used to have the primary experience between a consumer and the brand, be an in-store or an in-restaurant experience, that that experience may actually go away or be very different, right? You know, contest, contactless pickup, curbside check-in, all those things. The, the importance of connecting with customers over digital or communication channels to replace the gap that is no longer available with the in-store or the in, you know, um, you know, property experience is a huge factor in how many people are thinking about how do I continue to build trust and how do I continue to build relationships with the customers when the primary way that I used to engage those customers has been disrupted by COVID. So I think that's one big thing. I think another that we're seeing is that there are lots of customer service and customer experience teams that are looking at capacity that they had in these in-store experiences. So a lot of retailers had in-store associates, in-store specialists, they knew product well, they understood, they were good at styling sort of like, you know, either furniture or home purchases, or they were experts in certain areas of the product. And those resources for some of the folks that we've been talking to from a customer experience leadership perspective is they started to draw upon those in-store experiences and they pulled them into the digital experience in the mm -hmm. customer service teams. So what it does, is it does two things. One is it gets some of those folks back to work, right? Which is like they're, they're, they were furloughed or out of work or their stores were closed. Getting them back to work is actually a really positive thing. And then secondly, what it does is it allows for the commerce and or the, the retail experience to continue to happen, but it just happens in a different way, right? So that's another area. And then the third is you have this notion of customer service teams are traditionally centralized in a certain office. They're all in one place. They all have activity and they all have able to sort of like work with each other within an office space. Now everybody's working from home. How do you optimize that experience? How do you create collaboration in that experience? So I think the ways in which teams are now starting to work is very different in that you can't walk down the hall and get your question asked and answered, or you can't sort of turn around to your manager or supervisor to get some assistance on something. You have to be really good at a distributed workforce model. And you also have to ensure that the technology and infrastructure that you have in place supports that remote work experience as well. Mm -hmm. So lots more to share on that one, but I just think yeah. giving people the ability to sort of shift and change and adapt to what is now this new reality is a really important thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. Let's speaking of shifting, let's shift to another industry altogether. And uh, well, not altogether, because it's similar in the sense that Mike Keeney with uh, with Extended Stay America, in your industry, in the hospitality industry, you've under, undergone tremendous changes. And not even so much that are easy probably to adjust to because it's an in-person experience explicitly and, and definitively because people are coming to stay at your place. So, uh, Mike, tell us a bit specifically about your business model at Extended Stay America, which is different from the typical hotel stay and how it's adjusting to that result. Yeah, sure. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me today as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, Extended Stay America, we are different, right? So if you take a look at you know, the typical hospitality industry. And I know that we have, uh, you know, uh, some of my peers on here, I think you mentioned, you know, IHG and Hilton. Those hotels tend to be a little bit more, more transient. Um, our hotel, just by the nature of what we do, and obviously part of our name, is we cater to a slightly different audience. So while we do have some transient guests who might stay with us for one night or two nights, um, we have a lot of guests who might stay with us for seven or 30. We've had some guests in house for eight to 10 years, right? So that's on one extreme of the side, extreme. But because of that, um, our product is a little bit different. We have full kitchens in all of our, um, you know, in all of our hotels. We don't have, you know, restaurants. We have a limited breakfast service. So some of the amenities that we offer are a little bit different, um, which with what we're going through right now, in some ways has served us a little bit better because a lot of the people who we cater to are those essential workers. They're the folks who, um, might not necessarily have that discretionary uh, business travel, but are traveling because they need to. They might be, you know, a traveling nurse or part of, uh, you know, construction or any of those industries that, that still need to have that day to day. Um, you know, that said, we, you know, we still need to focus on, on, you know, what guests care about most. And Nigel, you know, you mentioned safety, right? And I think of the food and safety for the hotel industry. Um, I'd say it's cleanliness, right? Of course, we need to have a, you know, a safe place, but what everybody cares about, whether it's you know, before the pandemic or even currently, is what are we doing to make sure our hotels are clean um, and safe? And when you think about that, I, I think it was, it was Nigel who, who, who said it, it's not just something that um, you need to do, you need to communicate that you're doing it. And that's been one of the, the biggest shifts, I think, for us is something that we wouldn't necessarily think that we would have to communicate because it would just be understood in the past, right? Your hotel should be clean. But if you look, you know, across any of the brand messaging um, that, you know, we have or even other, other hoteliers have, um, whether it's an airline or a car rental, um, it's, it's focused on clean, even to the extent that, um, you know, some are going to um, seal a door to indicate, hey, this room, you know, has, has been sealed. Um, but the communication piece was, was, was interesting. Um, part of what, what we've even started to, to do is we have this, this concept of stay confident. And the, the whole purpose of stay confident is we want you to feel confident that when you come to our hotel, it's a safe place to be, um, and, and we've cleaned it. Um, so when we think about that communication, um, yes, that's been external, but we even have it um, internal. This probably won't come up. I just, that's the benefit of having stuff on my desk. But, this is something that we put, I know it's probably not going to work super well with it with the screen there, but that goes in all the corners of our, um, in our, in our, uh, in our, in our bathrooms. And it's not something that you think in the past we'd need to communicate, but we're taking that extra step to make sure guests know to hear the steps that we're taking to keep your, keep your room clean. So um, it's not so much that it's new things that we're doing, but how we communicate that um, you know, has become you know, pretty critical. Yeah, you know, Mike, that's a that's kind of a common theme that that I hear among a lot of folks when it comes to to CX and CX in this new world. It's about that communication, and as you alluded, Nigel had said it as well that it's about sharing with folks and empathizing with people and making sure that your customers are aware that you care about this. Sometimes, as you are, are alluding to, and and as Nigel had also said based on things that you've been doing all along, but it's now become more important to actually sh share that. Uh, I got a couple yeah. more questions, but we're getting some in here uh, from, from participants and, and folks who are attending. So please, 
everybody continue to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift what we were going to do because I want to go back to Nigel. This is an interesting question that comes in from Lulu. It says, how do you ensure customers still feel a personal touch now with contactless services? And then another question uh, here coming in from Tanya, how are you replacing or making up for the restaurant dining experience when your business has become contactless? So Nigel, um, talk to you about this. And then I think maybe Mike Keeney will ping on you a little bit as well, because obviously the contactless thing isn't not happening, but I know that you're changing some of the things about how you do stuff uh, in addition to the, the enhanced communication. So I want to come back to you too, and then sure. come back to, to Mike McCarran with another, uh, another question as well, but let's go ahead, uh, Nigel, let us, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And I would say it's one that we are still in some ways wrestling with because this is this is such a, a kind of quickly evolving uh, space, right? Um, you know, we, we've had to transition and mobilize so quickly, one, just to keep our doors open and keep serving customers that, you know, kind of leaning in and um, adding what I would call some of the icing on the cake as, you know, as, you know, the question uh, speaks to this idea of, ensuring a personal touch, even through the kind of rudimentary elements of a contactless service. So we've just been, uh, I would say a couple of things, we've been training our teams, uh, even through that contactless service, um, where, you know, there is, there is still an opportunity for communication. So with our contactless delivery, as an example, you know, the driver has to go to the door and the driver has to uh, deliver the pizza on the, on the stand. Uh, so kind of ringing the doorbell and stepping away, but kind of waiting for that customer to kind of come out uh, take their product, a smile, a wave, and kind of ensuring that there's still a human connection in that transaction where the driver doesn't just kind of walk away uh, from the from the tra transaction or be or you know you know completely but ensuring a human connection you know you think about contactless curbside very similarly some of those some of those mannerisms and those uh, human interaction can still apply although they take place you know six feet apart right <laughs> they can still apply so ensuring that uh, our employees engage with our customers um, and, and even even more so do it now I'll do it six feet apart, but, but do it all, all the same. So treating them from that standpoint uh, has been critical. Uh, the second piece I would mention uh, is just kind of what we do from a technology standpoint. So in terms, you know, our app has become, you know, it, it was before, but it has become increasingly so just the, you know, the significant portal, the window uh, to our business. You know, customers, I think, uh, Mike McCarran uh, mentioned it, you know, some of those in-store experiences are now shifted to more of a digital experience, right? And that has, that was uh, increasing in our industry uh, pre-COVID and, you know, with COVID, uh, I would say it has certainly accelerated. So ensuring uh, the information that we put on our app, uh, we personalize those experiences even further. So, uh, you know, individuals that are part of our loyalty program, uh, communicating to those individuals in a more personalized manner through email, through pop-ups, through their own personalized experience when they engage with our app is something that we have uh, worked on and we've done some things around there and we will continue to work on, right? So this is this is a space you can't stop. You've got to continue to evolve as you move on, but certainly ensuring that that engagement with our digital um, or digital assets, we, we, you know, we figure out ways to customize it based on uh, folks being part of our programs. And, you know, quite frankly, we're also in a data rich world, like data city. So if individuals are part of our loyalty programs, you know, we, we know a ton about those individuals. We, you know, we know their ordering patterns. We know, you know, their kind of guest checks. We know what they like to order. We know what they week they like to order. So there's a lot that we can customize in terms of how we communicate to those individuals to keep some element of that human touch, but you know, uh, to the to the individual who posed the question, it's certainly not an easy proposition, uh, and it's continually evolving. Yeah, you know, Nigel, uh, it sounds like if. Uh, just theoretically speaking, if an organization is dedicated to that customer interaction and dedicated to their customers as people, it's probably going to come through. You know, the business leaders that I talk to and the discussions that we have about how things are changing, if that's one of the core things about your company and about your connection to your customers is to have that, that personal interaction, you'll find a way to make it work even at six feet distance, as you're saying, right? And the in-person restaurant experience 
it has to be replaced. But if the core of what you do has to do with an interaction between you and your customers, then you'll find a way to keep that interaction happening just in a different format, right? Yeah, I think the challenge, and it's a great question again, the challenge is it's all about, because it's, it's you know, so much of the, the interactions are shifting to the digital space. And again, you know, this was, was the case pre-COVID, but that's even accelerated more now. It's all about how do you humanize that, that digital interaction, yeah. right? Um, and, and kind of finding clever ways of doing that through personalizing experiences is, is really the way to go. So if you understand yeah. more about your customer, how can you kind of personalize the communication through your CRM, um, um, your CRM teams? How can you do that? Yeah. You know, uh, Mike Keeney, um, to that point, N Nigel's talking about having data and having information about your customers. Uh, you and I spoke about this uh, recently. Sure. Um, there are a lot of different pools of information and data that are available. And I know that y'all at Extended Stay America are pulling data from various sources, turning that into empowerment, frankly, for your, your agents yeah. and your frontline team members. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's sort of funny, you know, when, it, when you think about uh, contactless and hospitality, it's almost an antonym, right? You know, you think about hospitality is, is, is touch and, you know, making people feel welcome, especially if they're, if they're staying a little bit longer. Um, you know, something interesting that we, that we got actually from some of our, from some of our data is, you know, when you think about a hotel, right, you would think that um, housekeeping, housekeeping is a service that um, you would want and you would want frequently. As we were hearing from our guests, something that we saw from our, our longer term guests, which we're actually seeing, you know, a shift to more longer term stay, even more so during this environment is, you would think that they'd want more cleaning and they'd want more, you know, um, you know, the room seen more often. But in, in reality, for some of our longer term stay guests, they, they did not want that. They didn't want somebody else in their room. They, they're there, they're there for a month, they're there for, you know, six weeks. They're like, you know what, I'll clean my room myself. So what we needed to sort of do is quickly take that um, and, you know, as a, as a hospitality company, something we'd never think of, right? We'll never have a customer saying, hey, provide me less service. But in some cases, because of the environment, they felt more comfortable doing that themselves. So what we would need to do in, in this example is we came up with, you know, with process that allows them to do touch-free linen exchange, right? So our hotels are... A little bit different. They're not staffed as much as a regular, you know, hotel. Um, sometimes, you know, in the evenings, there might just be one person there, you know, doing a, a close and, and, a, and a night laundry. So coming up with a process that makes our guests feel safe, um, allowing them not to have that interaction of them, you know, coming into their room, but still providing them the necessities and facilities that they need to do that linen exchange or to get those, uh, to get those, uh, you know, amenity exchanges. So that's just one example of of how we were getting you know, some of our customer data that we needed to react on almost real time um, and, and adapt pretty quickly. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's certainly other areas as well. We, we have certain reactionary data from our post guest surveys, um, but we do have you know, some real time data, whether it's from our, our, our property management system where we you know, enter information from you know, guest preferences and, and, and things of that nature. Um, all the way through, you know, our, our, our CRM system that tells us about our guests. So um, it, it truly is a little bit of a, of a different world of what guest preferences were just three, four months ago um, have, have shifted uh, you know, very much just because of, of the environment that we have today. Yeah. You know, that's, you highlight something that is really evergreen and it's, you, it's, it's a common theme in CX that customers don't care about your processes. <laughs> and to the example that you're using, if I tell one person at Extended Stay America something, I expect that to go into the ecosystem and everybody knows that I don't want anybody in my room and I'll clean it myself or I just want this contactless right. linen exchange and so forth. And it's amazing that the world can end <laughs> And yet people still feel that same way. And it's those flexible and dynamic organizations that are dedicated to their customers and to these core principles about what customers want. They're going to survive and thrive in an in instance like this. So that's a great example. And I know that Mike McCarron wants to talk about the, uh, the, the passing of information and the, how you approach that. But Mike, I'm going to ask you to hold off because we yeah. will get to that question. No <laughs> but I wanted to get to make sure that before we get too far into this, um, we, we 
circle back to the topic as, uh, at hand as well, in the title of the, uh, today's webinar, and it's the customer service leaders of the future. So I want to kind of go around and start with you, Mike McCarron, and, and give us your thoughts. What, simply put, in your opinion, does the customer service leader of the future look like? Great. I think, it's a, I think it's a great question. I think it's a great topic. So I'm really excited to be part of this conversation and talking about that. And, and thanks to Nigel and Mike also for being a part of this. Um, you know, I think that when you think about the customer service leader of the future, there's a bunch of different ways we could take that conversation. I kind of put down a couple of ideas and thoughts around that to kind of frame sort of what I look at and what I think what Gladly is seeing in the market with regards to customer service leaders. I think first and foremost, there's a a leader that has the ability to sort of like challenge the status quo or the mindset of what traditional customer service has always been and to try to think a little bit differently about how consumers as, as we've been talking about today what are consumers expectations how have those expectations changed and how are organizations thinking about those expectations and then evolving and changing to be able to meet those so i think that first and foremost it's looking at things differently. I think it's looking at, you know, how can you be more customer centered, put yourselves in the shoes of the customer or in the journey of that customer and identify all the places that the customer can fall over or have a sort of a not so great experience and to get those experiences taken care of and, and to smooth those out and to make sure you have great experiences there. I think the, the kinds of metrics that you use is another part of that mindset change, which is the traditional average handle time, first contact resolution, or other related historical or legacy metrics, while they're important and you need to have those, they're no longer sufficient to be able to really understand what that customer experience really looks like. And then I think, as you mentioned, the process around lots of people build customer service or customer experience processes as they relate to the technology and tools that they have in place. And so the leader should think about what is the right process that I want to have? What is the right experience I want to deliver to customers? And then leverage the technology or find the technology that supports that as opposed to saying technology works this way, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So that's first thing, first mindset change. Secondly, I think there's a huge focus on, and I think we've started to hear this a little bit here, cross-functional um, involvement or cross-functional participation, which is Customer service should not be the sole responsibility of the person with the CX title in their job, in their role. They need to be able to leverage the marketing team, the, su the supply chain team, the infrastructure team. They need to be cross-functional leaders to help build really strong business case or um, use cases for why improvements in the website design drives a better customer experience. How improvements in the online check-in check -in or check-out process improves the customer experience. Even though that customer service leader doesn't own the website and doesn't own the checkout process, but they have to be able to articulate a really strong value proposition for why cross-functional and, de and cross-departmental work has to happen. So that's kind of the second thing is like thinking about all that. And I think, you know, to my case point, leveraging data and insights, I think the, 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 the customer service leader of the future is going to be able to leverage data and insights to tell them where are things working well, where are things optimized, and where are things not so um, optimized, and how do you sort of improve that? I think a, a third area is around many customer service leaders or many customer service teams traditionally have been viewed by the organization as cost centers, which is they're there to help solve problems, they're, they're there to sort of be uh, focusing on issue resolution not issue prevention. So I think the customer service leader of the future is really thinking about how do I get in front of the customer's experiences or customer's issues and solve those before they actually happen. So thinking about that, I also think about the resources that are in customer service, especially in hospitality, travel, and retail commerce, is that in this new world of people maybe not leveraging the in-store experience as much, sales and revenue is going to be a huge driver for how do organizations weather this storm and customer service leaders that come from more of a sales background or more of a store background might actually have some interesting skills to bring to the table because they're thinking differently about how do I drive revenue and commerce through the customer service team and experience as opposed to just being there to resolve the issues that come at me. Um, I think moving away from, so fourth area is moving away from this you know, transactional service, which is I wait around for the phone to ring, I wait around for the email to come in, 
and moving more to a relational or a, a personalized experience where you can say, how do we treat our VIP customers? How can we sort of develop more personalized relationship with or with our you know frequent shoppers, our frequent buyers? Certainly, I would imagine for Mike K at, at Extended Stay, those high value customers that have long extended stays, how do you find ways to really engage with them and drive more of a personalized relationship with them? And I think the last thing is, is I would say is that customer service leaders of the future, I think look at or need to look at the staffing and the, the resources that they bring onto their teams and look at ways in which they can create teams that are highly functional um, with generalist skills versus very specialized skills. I think that the flexibility of what are the issues of the day, what are the challenges of the day are going are gonna to be so different from, from week to week and month to month that you need to have really strong sort of like utility players, if you will, on the team that have the ability to do re issue resolution, to solve problems for customers, to be thinking proactively about what to get in front of as opposed to being the person who can read the call script or can read the issue resolution script. I'm not saying that there's a lot of people out there doing that today, but I think the more sort of like forward looking thought leaders in customer service and customer experience are thinking about what does my team look like? What does the dynamic or the makeup of the team look like? And what are the skill sets that I'm going to be hiring for today that might be a little bit different than it was, you know, you know, five years ago, whereas I'm not just hiring someone to answer phones, I've got phones and chat and messaging and social and email. And frankly, I want all of those individuals to be able to shift back and forth across those channels pretty seamlessly. So those are sort of five big areas that I look at. There's probably five more or 10 more on top of that, but that's kind of an initial thought on what that leader looks like and how they're gonna be effective and successful in the future. Yeah, sounds like you came prepared with your homework done, Mike. That's, uh, <laughs> that's certainly a comprehensive. But what, what I like about that, first of all, is it sounds you've been reading my blog. So fantastic. Thanks a lot for hitting that. Because mm -hmm. I, I think it's what you're saying is there's a holistic perspective to it. I mean, among other things in there, but that's something that really stood out to me is that, you know, CX is more than CS. CX is more than a contact center. CX is, you know, Gene Bliss likes to say that it's, it's the human duct tape. It, ties all the silos together and helps provide that strategic direction for an entire organization. I'd like to bring the other guys into this conversation as well. Nigel, what are your thoughts about what, what, you'll, what you're seeing as the future of the CS leader? So a couple of things. I want to I wanna piggyback um, on something uh, Mike McCarran just said here, which, which I'm incredibly passionate about in, in, in our know, business, which is this idea of being slightly more cross-functional in terms of your approach. So, you know, what we've seen in our business is we, you know, and this has come out of, uh, this has been birthed out of necessity, which is in order to just survive the pandemic, you know, keep our stores open, uh, keep our operations going. Uh, you know, we, we have been able to leverage our crisis teams in order to drive that work forward as necessitated by the pandemic, right? But what that has given us an opportunity to do is, um, by nature of those themes, is be a lot more cross-functional in terms of our approach and break down those silos. So for the customer service leader of the future, um, I, I think you, know, you have to take advantage of the time and the temperature in your business right now in terms of your business being, and I, I can imagine it's the same for most businesses. You know, if you have, if you're operating a business right now and you're operating it in silos, you're going to have uh, tremendous difficulties doing that in today's world, right? The left hand has to know what the right hand is doing in order to ensure the customer um, is being serviced properly. So taking advantage of the moment right now as a, as a customer service leader of the future and ensuring that you know CX is brought to the table and the voice of the customer is brought to the table and you have a cross-functional team thinking about how you address those pain points in the journey I mean the moment is now to do it and, and I, I think uh, doing that is, is very important for the customer service uh, leader of the future the couple Nigel, of the things I'll, yeah go ahead no go ahead I was, I was just going to <laughs> Amen chorus over here. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> a couple of things I would, I, would, I, would, I would mention here, which is a little bit more tricky to do, but I would say 
you know, trying to anticipate the future but staying nimble in the present is, is pretty important, I think, for, for the, for the uh, customer service leader. So what I mean by that is, you know, we're just in such a dynamic space in terms of our world today. So what practices have we brought in that are going to be short term versus medium term versus long term? right trying to anticipate that and ensuring that we put practices systems tools and processes in place in order to support that is is pretty important uh, you know some of the things we brought in uh in terms of this time and space they may not stay long term right they may be uh, short term based on the environment uh, that we're in, you know, we get a vaccine, some of those things might go away. Um, but I, I do believe that the baseline has been reset, uh, definitely. So probably the majority of things will stay in some form or format. And trying to anticipate which ones of those will remain into the future is, is very, very important while being nimble in the present, right? Because, you know, every day we turn on the news, um, every week things change. So being very very nimble in the present uh, is, I think, a pretty important quality to have as well. So that we can then enable our customer service teams, our employees um, uh, to, to support the experiences of our guests. Yeah, Nigel, I think that's, that's brilliant. Those two points are, the, so I share with my clients all the time, it's what I see work, uh, it's, it's the use of the VOC. It's one thing to just listen to what they have to say about it, uh, what your customers have to say about their experience. It's another thing altogether to take that input, the insights that you get from the voice of the customer and do something with it. And if what you're looking for is to energize that cross-functional uh, collaborative atmosphere, there's nothing more useful than to say, here's what they're saying and here's what we can do about it. Uh, and that also allows you to show that value for your CX function in the first place, right? You're going to improve your processes, which is going to save resources, and you're also going to improve customer experience, which is going to boost revenues. It's a plus plus really. And if we're not advocating from that perspective, Nigel, then we're, we're missing the boat. And I also love what you say about being nimble uh, in talking with business leaders as, as I've been doing ever since this panic started. It's those businesses that can rely on their core purpose and their why, you know, to, to steal from Simon Sinek, the why they do what they do and not get caught up in the fact that with everything different now, we can't do it the same way we always used to. Keeping a laser focus on the purpose and the, 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 the mission and vision of your organization and finding new and creative ways to solve the problems that your customers are presenting to you. That's the way that you do it. And, and I think that uh, Animesh, uh, is, who's, who's written here, is, is talking about that and, and you know, more again with the, with the Amen Chorus. Mike Keeney, what are your thoughts and how are you experiencing these things at, at Extend to Stay America? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's just all about um, enabling, people to, enabling people to act. And it's always been important to listen, but it's probably ever more so important to listen you know, than we ever have before. And obviously there's tons of ways to do that with data. Some other ways that we're doing that and it's a little bit more of a, of a, of a, of a human approach is we all have data from our contact centers, right? Um, part of what we've done with our contact center is um, really try to make them feel as if they are associates at Extended Day America. So our contact center um, is outsourced. We have some internal guest relations associates as well. Um, but what we've done is we don't, just take the data out of the system. We'll sit down with them and say, well, what are you hearing? What are the themes on your calls? And it might sound like, well, why are you doing that, right? They're inputting the data into the system. That's critical, right? But sometimes there's things that don't fit neatly into a box and they might be hearing a theme from our customers, whether it's a reservation customer or it's an it's a inbound um, you know, guest relations you know, concern that they're like, oh yeah, I heard that, I heard that, I heard that as well. So. You know, there's a lot of different ways to, you know, to get that data out. Um, and Mike, you know, you said something uh, that, that sort of resonated with me about, you know, the, the people and make sure that you're getting the right people. And, and part of what we're trying to do, because um, we're in the early stages of, 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 uh, of this journey, um, the customer experience office is, is, is fairly new. And some of the associates that we're bringing into that, um, we're, we're bringing from our operations team. And the reason that we're doing that is they're the folks who have been experiencing this, you know, day in and day out for whether it's six months or six years or, or, or 10 years. 
And what we're finding is when we're, we're integrating them and blending them in together with some of the folks who have been doing customer experience for a long time, we're getting um, a, a very different voice. And, and maybe I shouldn't say a different voice because it, it's not like they're at odds with each other, but it's, it's a perspective from someone who's been face-to-face -face actually with that customer, you know, for years. So it's, uh, it, it, it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, we break some eggs along the, along the road of um, trying to try new ways of doing things. Um, but, but again, it's been pretty enlightening um, you know, to do that. But it, it, to me, it's really about listening to your people, taking a look at the data, and not doing either one of those silos and meshing them together. And that's where I think you go from information truly from there into insights. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. And I think this this tees us up to to talk a little bit uh, with with Mike McCarran about Gladly because I think this sharing of information and this stitching together and sewing together all the different, not just the bits of information, but bringing the entire organization uh, as a team together in the end of customer experience. That's really what y'all are about there at Gladly, right? And uh, you're developing and disrupting, uh, Mike Keeney, to your point, disrupting the way of looking at how customer support and customer service works, moving more towards a customer centric uh, or uh, towards customer centric rather, rather than just incidents and tickets and so forth. Tell us a bit, uh, Mike McCarran, about how Gladly is enabling your, your customers to do that. Yeah, absolutely. It, I think that um, if you think about it, like Nigel was bringing up a really good point, which is the ability to remain, you know, nimble and focused on both, you know, anticipating the future, but also being nimble in the present. I think one of the, that's probably one of the underlying sort of reasons or catalysts for why Gladly got going. So Gladly is about a five, six year old company. And five, six years ago, when the, when the early founders were looking at the customer service experience, they realized that a lot of the technology, a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the, the, the providers that were out there had been around for 15 or 20 years. They were well established, but those technology platforms were built before the days of the iPhone, before the days of social media, before the days of the fact that every consumer has on their device, phone, email, messaging, chat, and social as channels that they can use. And the ways in which they engage in those channels changes depending upon the situation that they're in. So if they're at home, web chat might be a really good experience, but if they're on the road, text messaging or social media might be better. Or if they're booking a, a big, long extended stay vacation or whatever, then maybe they wanna get on the phone and actually have that conversation. So Gladly started five years ago and said, there's gotta be a better way because all the legacy technology that exists out there fragments the customer's experience from emails to chats and chats to messaging, messaging to phone. And that's not the experience that consumers expect because they have vastly outpaced the ability for a lot of companies to keep up with the communication channels that they're using. So Gladly B2C focused customer service platform. And again, it's about how do you bring information about who this customer is or who this guest is? What's their purchase history? What's their, what are their buying behaviors? What is their lifetime value to the organization? presenting that information directly to the agents in a, in a view that pulls from all these really rich and relevant backend systems, along with the fact that you have phone calls and emails, messaging and chat dialogue happening in a very messaging oriented sort of timeline. It allows for the customer to be known. It allows for the agent to drive um, a personalized experience because they, they know exactly who this person is and they know how long they've stayed at extended stay or how long, how many pizzas they've ordered from Pizza Hut or how many products they've purchased. And it drives this amazing efficiency because the agents are no longer chasing down tickets, chasing down cases to try to figure this stuff out. So the idea is that we wanted to start a company and start, a, start a, 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 an organization that allowed for these innovative business to consumer brands who wanted to evolve and wanted to change and wanted to drive a better more seamless customer experience. But what many people found was that there wasn't really a good alternative solution to a lot of the legacy case and ticket based systems that existed in the past. And so they were forced to kind of put a, a round peg into an oval hole where it kind of looks like it should fit, but it doesn't. And then the frustration is you have to sort of make up for all these inefficiencies or these deficiencies 
And we thought in the modern day and age where consumers are driving expectations, let's match those expectations with a technology product that is innovative, is thought leading and is um, able to allow for organizations to move quickly to really drive better experiences across all the channels that they have. So that's kind of the Gladly story. And we're finding that brands that are moving to Gladly, it's a, be, it's a far better agent experience because they have all the information and all the communication history in front of them. It's a far better experience for the consumer or the guest because they don't have to tell their story over and over again if they move from an email to a, a, a chat session or a chat session to a phone call because all those channels are natively built there. And in the process, loyalty is up, revenue is up, people wanna do business with companies that make it easier for them to do business with them. It's kind of a magic win across the board for everybody involved. Yeah, you know, and you're speaking again to, to something we discussed earlier about how the customers don't care about your processes and they expect that seamless experience. And we used to talk about channel switching and, and, and efficiencies in there. And it doesn't even matter anymore. I'm thinking actually to a, to a webinar that we had about a month or so ago and Aaron Sheehan from the San Diego Padres was on and she was talking about tying the experience that customers have when they buy season tickets in with the experience that they have when they go to watch the game. And it's mm -hmm. organizations that can seamlessly tie those data sources in the background, right? in with that experience so that everybody that's interacting with a customer can understand and see what's going on. Uh, Nigel, what are your thoughts on this? And how is it that in, in the food industry, that sort of thing, you know, I know when I, when I log on, I can see what my order history is. That's an example of this, right? But what else is going on now? And are you seeing anything new happening? Yeah, I think it's certainly challenging. Um, and, you know, I find, you know, to Mike McCown's point, it's, it's, definitely a need and I think you know different companies are on different stages of that journey I think most companies now most leaders now recognize the need for doing so bringing bringing all that data together and all the customer information in one one space so you know individuals have access to it and therefore we can service the customer better I think part of the challenge has been you know in terms of the concept of what you need to do. I, I think most people are clear on that. The question is, how do you get there, right? Um, how do you bring uh, those systems together in a quick and efficient way that makes sense for everyone, a cost-effective way? How do you get to that point? And that has been the challenge, you know, what, what pathway to go down, uh, what, you know, what road uh, to travel, uh, so to speak, as it pertains to, to getting there. And, and, you know, we're certainly trying to get there more and more. Um, you know, we've introduced the fairly new customer experience platform where we're bringing in more data um, on the customer than we've probably ever done before and providing uh, that data to our, our contact center so that once a customer calls, they can kind of understand the history of the customer a lot easier to, to service the customer. So, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, we're not all the way to bright yet, certainly, uh, but, but, you know, uh, going along that direction and trying to get there is certainly um, the, you know, the utopic world we're trying to get to. Yeah, I'm sure that Mike McCarron would be the first to say, well, you've got the right guy on the phone right now to talk about how you make it happen, <laughs> right, Mike? Yeah, yeah. But before I get to your pitch, though, Mike, can you tell, tell us about that? I mean, we already talked a little bit about how Extended Stay America is using the data sources to, to enable you know, various team members who do different things to make that experience spectacular for your guests. Tell us a little bit more about what you, what you have to say on this topic here. Yes, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because as I mentioned before, we're, we're, we're new in this journey. And even, even our, our CRM, a lot of our CRM that we've done in the past has been focused um, more on B2B, less on B2C, because a lot of our, our business, especially some of our longer take, say business, you know, our customer might be that B2B customer, whether it's, a, uh, you know, again, a construction or a medical or, or that. So um, we're on the beginning stages of the, uh, you know, of, of the B2C uh, customer journey. Um, you know, interestingly enough, go back to, you know, that, that theme of hospitality and um, a lot of times we might not have a lot of folks who would stay in one extended stay and then go to another extended stay, you know, across the country. Sometimes it happens, but a lot of times this is the blend between a typical hotel stay and a long-term apartment. So what we'll do, and this will actually answer one of the questions that came across uh, that, uh, that Lori asked is, 
Um, you know, many companies would have an example where you know, 10 minutes or so after you get into your room, you'd get a text message and saying, hey, is everything okay you know, with, your, you know, with your room? And that's something that, that we're looking at and we're evaluating and we'll be piloting. At the same time, our, our culture um, tells us that something that's just been in our brand for a while is after you've been in your room for 15 minutes, the front desk calls. So that's you know, some of how we figure out, do we go and, and, and use text, which appeals to many folks and you'll more, more likely get a more honest feedback there, but do you lose some of that personal touch when you do that um, by replacing some of the existing process that we you know, have with the phone call? Um, so really what we're looking into there is just how do we maybe do you know, a hybrid of that? Of, an example might be to you know, place, that, place that phone call and, to, and let them know, uh, well, you know, you're going to be getting a, you know, a link from us in, in, in 30 minutes or so. Um, if there's something wrong, please let us know. Because something that we do recognize is it's a lot easier to give critical feedback or give something that needs to be fixed um, if it's not face-to-face. -face. So you're very unlikely to give it face-to-face -face on the front desk because you have to physically tell that to somebody directly to their face. It's a little bit more likely if you do it in a phone call, but if you provide an electronic means, You'll, you're more likely get um, you know, some more, more accurate feedback. So those are just some of the types of things that we're trying to um, you know, have that little tug of war of how much technology do we embrace while still trying to have that, uh, that personal uh, touch that a lot of our guests have, uh, have come to expect from us. Yeah, yeah, you bet. And again, it's about bringing those all together and presenting it to Correct. the customer. What makes you comfortable? How does it work for you? It's meeting your customers where you are. Fantastic. Let's, um, we're, we're running up on the top of the hour here and we got lunch coming up. So I uh, want to swing through here. Last go around, um, exit question um, for, for, for all three of you guys. We'll start with Nigel. Um, your thoughts, uh, what's coming? What's next? And, and, you know, the future of customer support and service is, and then go ahead and finish that. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great one. Um, I think the, 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 I'll go back to what I said. I think the, the future of um, customer support and service is uh, continuing to um, lean into, quite frankly, what, what we did in the past, which is uh, human relationships and the human experiences. So as we go more into technology, that's great, but continuing to figure out ways to humanize those experiences, not getting away from that, I think it's, 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 it's still very important. We, you know, yeah. ultimately, we're still we're still human beings. Uh, relationships are very important to us, right? Emotions are very important to us. So, uh, continuing to lean into that space, even as we get more efficient from a technology standpoint. I think it's going to be even more important in the future than it was in the past. Yeah, we gotta we gotta push back against dark mirror, I guess, right? <laughs> we gotta, Keeney, we gotta embrace it, but embrace it in the right way, right? Yeah, right. We don't want to get out of control. Yeah. Mike Keeney, what are your thoughts? Future? Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it might sound like an oxymoron, but it's it's using technology to try to figure out how to deliver that personal touch, and 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 then there's the there's the personalization of it because of the, the four of us you know, pictured here right now, we might have um, four different preferences of how we interact when we board a flight, when we check into a hotel room, when we order a pizza. Um, so I think using technology to enable that and enable that personalization and know how we want to be interacted with and what's important to us, I think that's really where um, you, know, you start to resonate with that customer and that's where you get them to want to come back because people want to go where they feel like they're known where they feel like they're appreciated. And the more that you're able to do that, um, that's where I think you're going to drive those repeat customers. Yeah, you bet. Not necessarily finding the right, and, and, it's, and it's an avatar for it, but it's not about finding the right channel. It's about giving the option for channel to the customers and being wherever they want you to be. And that's, that's just right. one aspect of it, but it's an example across the entire enterprise, right? Yeah. Mike, McCarran, yep. what are your thoughts? Yeah, just, yeah it's awesome. Now, actually, I'll comment on that last piece, and then I'll sort of give my closing thought, which is, you know, the, the interesting thing about the consumer market today is that there are consumers across the entire age demographic that, that are going to sort of gravitate towards some channels as being a preference, but a lot of the research and a lot of the insights that we're gathering and seeing is that they're not going to use just one channel. They're going to use all the channels and they might use one of those channels because it's convenient for them at that time. But you can't say the phone and email are legacy channels and those are going away and we're going to only do messaging and AI because that's going to that's going to sort of create a, an impersonal experience, which is the last thing I think a lot of the business consumer companies need to be doing these days. They need to be going 
more towards personalization. But it, but Nick, you're right. Like finding the opportunity or finding ways to meet customers in the channels that they prefer and they prefer in the moment is really, really important. But how do you do that and keep the context of that customer's experience across all those channels in one place? That's where sort of the, the secret sauce is. And I think yeah. that, that is a big part of where the future of service is going is that the, the brands no longer have the ability to dictate how consumers interact with them or the channels within which they interact with them. They have to make it available to them to do all those channels, but they have to do it in a way that doesn't fragment the experience across backend systems that really drive more, you know, less personalization across the board. Yeah, ultimately, you're looking for that experience and, it, and the channel is simply a vehicle for it. Nobody wants the better mousetrap. They just want the mice out of their pantry, right? And <laughs> right. as long as we think about what the tools are that we're using instead of what the solution, what the problem is our customers are trying to solve, that's where we get off the rails. Uh, Mike uh, McCarran, thanks so much. Mike Keeney from Extended Say America, thanks so much. Nigel from Yum and Pizza Hut, uh, appreciate it. Um, thanks so much to Gladly. Bring um, Scott back in here if Scott wanted to sing us out. There you go. Scott, you're way too young to know when I say the time life operator, but I think everybody who's my age knows exactly what I mean when they see that picture of you up there. So yeah. bring, bring us home there, Scott. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Nick. And uh, that wraps up today's webinar. Um, I know we've covered a lot of ground and discussed some incredibly interesting topics. Um, I hope everyone found it informative and, and really engaging. Um, I'd like to take a brief moment to thank each of our fantastic panelists, Mike, Nigel and Mike, for uh, lending us their time and expertise today. I'd also like to thank our moderator, Nick Zeisler, for guiding us through today's discussion. And finally, I'd like to thank today's sponsors, um, Gladly, for working with us to create this hugely successful webinar. Um, if you'd like to check out what they have to offer and how it can benefit your business, please head over to www.gladly.com or look out for more details attached alongside the recording of today's webinar. Last but not least, I'd like to thank each and every one of you who joined us today, whether that be live or listening on demand. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and gained some actionable takeaways. Um, we did receive a, a large number of questions um, and some unfortunately we didn't manage to get onto. So where possible, those questions will be passed on and, and followed up. Um, but yeah, thank you all from all of us at Reuters events and uh, we hope to welcome you back soon and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>